Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's house this morning as we celebrate the fourth Sunday of Advent. And as we do so, our theme for worship is the Lord's deliverance is at hand. As we worship today, we'll follow the order of service of service of word and sacrament following the Advent candle lighting. And so let us begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When God created the world, he made the crown of his creation, the human race, in his image. Perfect people lived in a perfect world in a perfect relationship with God. However, God, who is love, did not want to be separated from his children forever. He promised a Savior who would bear the punishment for sin, defeat the devil, and break the bonds of death. Please join with me in singing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. When the time had fully come, God sent his Son, Jesus our Savior, who has paid the ransom for your debt. Your sins are forgiven. In view of God's mercy, today we light the love candle. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice. In the love of God, we go to the world, to our friends, relatives, acquaintances, and neighbors. We regard no one from a worldly point of view. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us. In him we have become the righteousness of God.
Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Take away the burden of our sins and make us ready for the celebration of your birth that we may receive you in joy and serve you always. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson today is taken from Micah, chapter 5. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. The word of the Lord. Let us join in singing now our psalm of the day, which is Psalm 85. Our second lesson from Revelation chapter 12, this portion of the word will be the basis of our sermon. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain, and she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. He, his, his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. 
the dragon, stood in front of the woman who is about to give birth, so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. The word of the Lord. Alleluia. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. and They will call him Emmanuel. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of our gospel. The gospel appointed for the fourth Sunday in Advent is the gospel according to Luke chapter 1. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated as we join in singing hymn 396, in Adam we have all been one.
In the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, who is coming soon, my dear brother and sister in the Lord. It is Christmas time. And you might very well know that because you listen to the radio. And as you do so, you hear Christmas songs. Just about every station. It doesn't matter what it might be. Rock and roll, jazz, easy listening, country. All Christmas, all the time. And one of the more popular songs this Christmas season is one of the oldies but goodies. The old Andy Williams, It's the most wonderful time of the year. And I love that song, but it's probably not for the reason that you think. It's not the lyrics. Those are pretty bad lyrics. And it's not even the tune. What I love most about Andy Williams' song is the trumpets. Oh my goodness, when they get to that refrain and they're squealing those high notes as they're going through the melody, I just love that. I find that to be one of the greatest riffs in music. But as you think about that Andy Williams song, because it is so popular and it's played probably once every 15 minutes on the radio, you begin hearing those lyrics and you think to yourself, yeah, all right, yeah, it's the most wonderful time of the year. But why? It's certainly not because of all the things he talks about. He's focusing on family and gifts and stories and mistletoes and all sorts of other Christmassy stuff, I suppose. But the main reason why you and I would all agree this is the most wonderful time of the year is because it has everything to do with John's visions. We have an entirely unique perspective today. One that I don't think we ever look at from this perspective. And that would be God's perspective. A heavenly vision of the first Christmas. As we think about our lesson for today, John has a vision. Two of them, actually. He sees a vision of a birth, a battle, and a victory. And today, we view this all from heaven's perspective. So when you think about Christmas stories, my guess is that Revelation 12 doesn't make your short list. I don't think you're probably thinking about a dragon and a baby and this dragon devouring a child. Yeah, that's not what we think about at Christmas. It's usually like our Old Testament lesson. Something that you may have memorized when you were a child at St. Paul's and you said, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, and so on and so forth. Or maybe a prophecy from Isaiah. Or maybe just Luke chapter 2, as you've probably memorized that as well. Maybe these are the things that come to your mind, more traditional, I, I would presume. When we think of the nativity and when we think about Christmas, we have the thoughts of, you know, cows and sheep and all sorts of other characters like the shepherds and Mary and Joseph, of course, and, and the baby Jesus. We have thoughts of away in the manger, silent night, joy to the world. And yet, as we read this section of Scripture, we see John's perspective that is being revealed to him of a Christmas in the background of it, and we really see the battle that is waging between God and his adversary. You see, all of a sudden, your not-so-garden-variety Christmas picture. And so, let us take a look at this Christmas vision from the heavenly perspective. As it was seen by John, this is a revelation. And as we read the book of Revelation, it'd probably be good for us to just refresh our memory. There's a lot of symbolism in the book of Revelation. And much of the symbolism, almost all of it, reinforces the victory that Christ has won. If you were to just be able to simply summarize the book of Revelation, it could really be as simple as this. God wins. That's it. You could summarize an entire book that way. And indeed, as we look at this section, 
It's just yet another description of how God wins. Our lesson begins. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. As we look at this portion of scripture, many people would very logically and very easily think that the woman being talked about here in the word of God must be Mary, because Mary is the one who gave birth to the son. That would make sense. But it's not. Good guess. This is not talking about Mary. In fact, as we look at the rest of the lesson, we can clearly see that the woman that is being talked about here is the Christian church. Because the Christian church, the, who the Lord Jesus came out of, and whom the Lord God protected, and whom the Lord God has sustained, is certainly what is being described here. As you see, all of that symbolic language regarding the sun and the moon and the 12 stars in her head, we can see that unique picture of the complete Christian church on earth. The prophecy that we're seeing here then really is of the beginning of the battle. The battle between the devil and God. This began a long time ago. In fact, in the book of Peter, we can see a description of that great battle. Michael and all of his angels, along with the Lord God Almighty, fought against the evil forces of the devil and the other evil angels and cast them down out of heaven. And the Lord God, at some point in time during the days of creation, created a place for these foul beings. And that is where hell was started. During this rebellion, as God all of a sudden created all things in this world perfectly, the devil then began his prowl. The devil began looking about and how he could thwart and mess up God's creation. And he was good at it. In fact, the devil went about taking Adam and Eve and as they were unknowingly and unwittingly talking with a serpent, they didn't even know that they were falling into sin. In his wily sense, he approached these two individuals. He knew what he was doing. He knew that he wanted in every way for Adam and Eve to join him in hell itself. And so he created temptation for them, which they fell into, of course. And so the heavenly battle began again. The Lord God would not allow the devil to thwart his perfect creation anymore. And so the Lord God promised that there would come a day when there would be a great and wondrous sign when one would be born who would crush the serpent's head. When we think about that prophecy, we look towards what we heard in our Old Testament lesson. It is the prophecy from Micah that really shines a light on the specific details of this vision that the Apostle John is viewing. It shows us the place and time and who and what. It gives us all of that and now, in hindsight, as we look back, we can clearly see that the child that was to be born, the child that John saw in the vision, and the child that was to be born according to the prophet Micah was Christ our Lord. Micah recorded, Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she, is, she who is in labor gives birth, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and, the sh and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. The only problem with this is that it took time. The promise that the Lord God made to send a Messiah into this world to rescue mankind from their sin 
it took time. Adam and Eve, they lived for almost an entire millennia, but the Savior was not born. They waited and waited, but they did not see the Messiah. Year after year, century after century went by, and the Israelites waited, and they did not see this Messiah. And even in Micah, as he is pointing forward to the coming Messiah, another 500 years needed to go by before the fulfillment finally came true. Because then it happened. 500 years after the prophecy, the great and mighty warrior was finally born. He finally came onto the scene. And will it be just like when Michael and God cast the devil out of heaven? No. It's not going to be like that battle at all. This battle will be between a dragon and a baby. Then another sign in heaven appeared, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. This battle will be fought between a dragon and a child? This is an interesting heavenly vision, is it not? When you picture the manger scene, my guess is that you got Mary and Joseph in the middle with the baby Jesus, but there's no dragon. At least not in the ones that I've ever seen have I ever noticed a red dragon anywhere about the manger scene. And yet that's the vision that heaven itself portrays to John. This is the case of how the devil was attempting to thwart the very promises of God. And why wouldn't we think that? Because this is what the devil has been doing ever since the beginning. He has constantly been trying to destroy the plans of God. And so as the devil, who clearly knows Scripture, who clearly knew the promise of God, he was going to go about in every way possible to try and dis to destroy the promised Savior. And we can look at Scripture and clearly see all of the attempts at how the Lord Christ, when he was first born, that his birth and his life was not really ordinary. I mean, let's just even go to the birth of Christ. Could there have been any involvement in the evil one trying to devour this child by having this child born without a midwife present, in a manger, by cows and other things? Doesn't seem really good, does it? Seems pretty out of the ordinary. And not only that, many of you, I'm sure, could have on your minds, well, there was that time when... When Jesus was a toddler, just a few years after his birth, when the Magi were coming to visit, and then there was that king called Herod, and he was completely nuts, and he wanted to kill this king that was born. And so he had the Magi, yeah, 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 yeah. go find him, go find him, please. And when you do, you, you tell me so I can go and find him and worship him. Yeah, that's what I'll do. All he wanted was his search and destroy team of the Magi to report back so that he could go and destroy this newborn king. Certainly with sin in his heart, corrupting his mind, that Herod himself is po quite possibly the fulfillment of these words as he's attempting to kill the Son of God. Yet, how were the plans of the devil thwarted? How did a baby 
survive such an attack? Such an attack with, with the devil, the red dragon, waiting right there, ready to devour him. How is that possible? Well, it was possible because the Lord God was guarding and protecting his son and those that were his parents here on earth listened to God's promise. Listening to the Lord really became a pretty normal exercise for Mary and Joseph. If you recall, Mary and Joseph both have had several opportunities in which the, the angel Gabriel came and visited them. They listened to God's messenger, first of all, about the child that she was to bear. And she listened and rolled that thought around in her head and she pondered it. And she absolutely believed and trusted. Then Joseph, who was completely a bit frustrated with this entire situation, confused and ready to divorce her, then also was visited by the angel to then be reassured, no, 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 this is not a child of human decision, but this is a gift from God, and you shall call him Jesus, because he will be the Savior of all. You recall even again, as Joseph and Mary were asleep, Joseph had the angel appear to him again, and that he should go and flee to Egypt so that his son, Jesus, would not be taken and killed amongst all of the other innocent boys in Israel under Herod's rule. All of this taking place, all of this happening with two faithful parents who listened and obeyed the word of God. They did not say, well, you know, it's not really convenient. You know, I really don't like going to Egypt during this time. It's a little busy. That's a touristy time. I really don't like it. It doesn't fit into my schedule. I really think this might work better next year. No! They listened. They obeyed. Because the Lord God Almighty commanded them. And so they went. And the Lord God Almighty sustained the life of his son so that three decades later, he could take away your sin. As we look at this heavenly Christmas vision, we can certainly see the great effort that the Lord God is using in preserving his one and only son so that he could one day accomplish all that needed to be done for your sins and mine. We see this overarching picture of a child who's going to rule over all the nations and judge all of the nations. We see all of this planning. We see all of this effort. And what are you and I doing? As we see God sending a baby to slay a dragon, fending off evil at every pass, are we really just going to sit around on our hands and do nothing? Are we just going to be idly sitting around saying, well, that's not my job. Somebody else can do it. Are we really going to just take for granted all that God has done for us? Are we really just going to look at our own lives and convince ourselves what is more important, what I want to do or what God has told me? Do we really believe ourselves when it comes to time and say, I am so busy. God, you'll have to wait yet another week. I'm not going to read your word. I'm not going to go to your house. I'm not going to come to your table. I'm not going to do these things because golly gee, my schedule is so full. Are we serious? Is this really what it has come to? All of the effort God has done on our behalf. And here we are saying, no thanks. I'll do it on my time. I'll do it when it's convenient for me. Really? Is that really what it has come to in our hearts? Where we're now looking at it from my perspective only? That God is no longer a priority? That I don't worship him? I don't read his word? I don't grow? I don't do that? That's hard. Or that takes time. Or that takes effort. Or that's in my time. Let me tell you from the perspective of your pastor. You can just look at the numbers. There certainly seems to be a growing apathy among us. 
there's a growing apathy among us when it comes to our desire to hear the Word, grow in the Word, read the Word, and study the Word. There are people here that you know very well that are not here. They haven't been for a while. Could it be because we're just becoming spiritually lazy and complacent? And we are unwilling to do these things because we have just simply taken all that God has done for us for granted. How dare we? Here God is fighting dragons for us and we don't even make an effort to grow. Here God is saving us from our sins and going to every extent to rescue us and we're not willing to change? To do anything? Are we really just saying, as long as it fits in my schedule, I'll do it? What's wrong with us? It's like we're just simply content to merely live on spiritual life support. The fact is, God, God shows us this heavenly Christmas vision not so that we can merely survive, but it's ultimately so that we can thrive. Notice what John sees. John does not see us losing. John sees victory. John sees a child who is born that he has come to rule and to rule the nations with an iron scepter. John sees this child who is born to live an entire life in complete harmony and in complete unity with his heavenly Father. John sees, unlike us, a child who is willing and delighted to go to his father's house. He sees a child who is willing and delighted to sit at his worship leader's feet to soak in all of what God has said to him. He sees a child who is delighted to put the will of his heavenly Father in his life first. And he is delighted to do all these things because of his love for you, to ultimately save you, to ultimately slay the red dragon for you, to ultimately one day, decades later, to be nailed to a tree on a dreadful day. We call that Good Friday. The devil's dancing with glee because he had thought he had won. And yet, as Christ proclaims, it is finished. And he seals that victory, that fight with the devil, with his resurrection from the grave. And he doesn't just say, look at what I've done. I've done this for myself. But he has handed it to you. What a precious gift that this heavenly Christmas vision brings to us. It is not something that we just simply can look at and disregard, but it's something that we look at and embrace and give thanks for. That this child born to the church is one who has rescued them, one who has then taken care of them. As we see at the last verse, the woman, the church, fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God. God has his church in his hands protecting us, caring for us, tending to our needs at every turn. So let us go to him and let us pray to him and let us grow in him. So what are we going to do? We should probably think about implementing change. Change in ourselves, change in our minds, change in our patterns of behavior. I mean, might as well. This time of the year, we always talk about change. We call them New Year's resolutions. Might we ever keep one of those? Might we ever think about what we should do and then actually do it? Might we think about this mighty battle and this great victory that John shows us in this Christmas vision from heaven? And might we just see that I need to repent. I need to change. I need to set time aside for God. 
I need to prioritize him number one in my life. I, I'm all messed up. All messed up. I need to know him. I need to learn about him. Because I don't know how much time I have left. But I do know this. I do know Christ saved me. So I should probably get to know him better. This is exactly what the Lord God has given you the opportunity to do today. To be here today to hear his word to grow so that you may know him better, so that you may take him to heart and give thanks that you might be able to partake of his body and blood, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins, that you might be renewed in your faith so that you can go and you can tell others, so that you might be emboldened in the word and so that you might be able to share with others this great battle that was fought between a child and a dragon and the great victory that this child has won for all of us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. Let us confess our faith today, and we'll use the words of the Nicene Creed. We join together. We believe in one God, the Father, and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God. our special prayers today. We continue to pray for Anna Reich, who, God willing, will be coming back to church soon enough. She is at home now recovering, so we give thanks to the Lord for her recovery thus far. We ask the Lord God to also be with Irene Heiliger and Janet Clark, both who are in hospice care, and both are, are expected to be with Jesus sooner than later. We pray for Pastor Mark Cars. He is the individual that the that our Lord God directed us to call as our next pastor, our associate pastor. We also pray for Mr. Jason Gibson, who the Lord directed us to call as our next principal. And then finally, we'll ask that the Lord continue to bless the deliberation process that I am going through as, as I consider the call that I have here as well as to St. Peter in Minnesota. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood which you give us to eat and drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food, increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, 
and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help them with deeds of kindness. Lord God, our great physician, we give you thanks for bringing healing and relief to Anna Reich, and we would ask that this healing may continue. Throughout the highs and lows of this world, we ask that you would continue to direct Anna's heart and mind and her prayers to you, her God and Lord. Lord God, it also seems clear that you are about to call home Irene Heiliger and Janet Clark. As their time here on earth is drawing to a close, keep them close to you as, they're, as they are dear lambs in your flock. Also, Lord God, we pray that you would bless Pastor Mark Cars and Mr. Jason Gibson as both are deliberating calls to serve here at St. Paul's or to remain at their current calls in Minnesota and Washington, respectively. We ask that this may be a blessing and whatever decision that they come to, that you grant them peace and confidence. And finally, Lord Jesus, we ask that you would continue to bless the process that I am going through as I deliberate between St. Peter and St. Paul's. We ask that this process may be a blessing both to St. Paul's and St. Peter's alike, and that you may grant peace and confidence in the decision that I come to soon. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and we now ask you, dear Lord, to hear us as we bring you our private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We also join to pray the prayer Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We continue with the order of service for the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Through his holy prophets he promised a king to bring light to those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
The Lord's Supper is prepared. Those who are confirmed members of a Wells or ELS church are invited to come forward and partake of this great blessing. Please stand and join with me in the song of thanksgiving. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. may be seated for our closing hymn.
Good morning. That's our schedule. Take note of it and take it to heart. Uh, one change was the children's service, which is now at 6 p.m. Uh, we have two repeating services on Christmas Eve. That would be the 3.30 and the 6.30. Those would be the two same services. We have a Christmas Eve candlelight. will be unique and different. We will have Christmas Day. Again, will be unique and different. And then the 26th is the next day, which will be unique and different. And so I would invite you to please come and worship our newborn king those days. Um, as you do see on Sunday, December 26th and Sunday, January 2nd, because of just the times that we are in, we have brought together our two services just for those two Sundays. So we will worship at 9 a.m. on the 26th and 9 a.m. on the 2nd. So please make a mental note, physical note, whatever kind of notes that you need to make so that if you get here at 8 a.m., you might want to bring coffee. Or maybe it'll be already done and we can drink coffee together till worship starts at 9. Other than that, uh, we have a bit of a change in our Bible study schedule. We will be having Bible study today. We'll be studying the book of Matthew. We'll just get started and look at the genealogy of Jesus as well as the birth proclamation of Jesus and so forth. Um, and then tonight, because of Lakeside's uh, sacred concert, we will not be having evening Bible study tonight. Uh, we'll be actually taking a two-week break uh, with our Sunday evening. This coming Wednesday, don't be confused, as I'm probably going to, we will have Bible study. <laughs> so, so if you can make it, we'd love to see you. We're going to be talking about gender identity, who makes the call in that regard. A very difficult topic, a very timely topic, and certainly we see it all around us in our world today. And so come and join us and discuss these things and discuss these matters. And then the next topic is going to be about Santa Claus. And so you certainly can come and learn about that topic as well. Very timely topic. All right. I got a couple of letters here. One from Pastor Cars. I'll read that one first. And just a, a news item. He's a guy from Nebraska, so he might be a little sad this morning. Oh, well. Go Bucky. All right. He writes, Dear brothers and sisters of St. Paul's, greetings in the name of our risen and ascended Savior, Jesus Christ. This past week, I received a divine call that you have extended to me to serve as an associate pastor at St. Paul's. I am truly humbled by this opportunity to serve you. I, along with my wife, Olivia, will give it much prayerful attention and consideration over the next few weeks. Having received information about your ministry, I've begun the process of careful deliberation as to where God would have me best serve him at this time, whether in my current call at Calvary and St. John's or to serve your congregation in Fort Atkinson. I look forward to speaking with you and your leaders over the next several weeks, learning about your ministry at your congregation, evaluating my current congregation's needs, and also assessing my own personal gifts. I welcome any and all communication with you, so please feel free to contact me via email, phone, text. Throughout the upcoming weeks of discussion and contemplation, I trust the Lord will lead me to a decision which will best serve his church. I would ask that you would remember my family and me, as well as the congregation I serve in your prayers. We have also begun to pray for you. Every change in life, personal or congregational, is an opportunity God gives us to grow in our faith and trust in him. And so as we go through this process together, let the words of the Apostle Paul give us encouragement. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13. May the Lord grant you a merry and blessed Christmas as you celebrate the birth of our Savior, Pastor Mark Cars. And then also we called a new principal. Uh, his name is Mr. Jason Gibson, and he writes, Dear members of St. Paul's Lutheran Church, Greetings in the name of our Advent Lord. I am humbled that you have called me to serve as your principal. I ask for your prayers as I consider this call and where the Lord would have me serve. God's blessings to you as you prepare to celebrate the birth of our Savior. In Christ, Mr. Jason Gibson. So I've had an opportunity to talk with both of these individuals. Oops. And uh, both Pastor Cars and Mr. Gibson would be just wonderful uh, uh, additions to our ministries here, so please pray. If you would like to have the contact information for Pastor Cars or for Mr. Gibson, uh, just let me know, and I certainly can, can let you have their numbers and or their emails, and you certainly can correspond with them as well. I'm sure they would appreciate that. So, the Lord's blessings to all of you. See you in Bible class. Have some coffee. Uh, we also, I believe, have some treats. I'm not entirely sure. Are the treats still here, Ruth? Do you know? 
I think they are. Yeah, so we should have treats. If they're not out, they will be soon because I don't want to eat them all. So God's blessings. Have a good day.